do, we've got Scott Shelley. He is with Ag Optimus, which is a division of Optimus Futures, which is one of our sponsors today. And he, Scott can frequently be seen wearing his trademark cow jacket, as you can <laughs> see now. And he's on TV all over the place, all the time. CNBC Europe, Bloomberg, CNN, BBC, Fox Business News. And we're super excited to have him to, here today to, to just let us fill us in on what's what's going on right now so let's see wall street main street and nightmare on helm street i love that title we're going to talk about the potential efficacy and impact of a covid19 vaccine the trajectory of the economy and investor climate and the willingness of the fed to backstop the market scott welcome good to be here hopefully you can hear me we can, oh, do. We can certainly hear you hi scott Hi, good morning, or good afternoon, I guess, for you. I suppose you're in a different time zone, but uh, yeah, it's crazy times. So I can uh, I can share my screen if you'd like. Absolutely. Absolutely. Take it away. Uh, Scott, yes, we have people from all over the world here. So it is morning, afternoon, and evening. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. Um, well, that's, that's, that's mildly imitating uh, intimidating to hear that we've got people from all over the world. So uh, I've got a, <laughs> I've got a European passport. So maybe I've got some of it covered. Um, okay. right. And I used to work a lot in Asia. So we'll see. But uh, uh, I guess should I jump in? What, what, what's what's protocol? You take it away. Yeah. We'll be here to support you. And uh, <laughs> you it's your time. I need all the support I can get. Right. So uh, any crutch, uh, any crutch thrown my way. <laughs> Well, yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm always glad to do these types of things. Uh, I do I do quite a few of them, but most of them, you're right, I, I are in front of a live camera. And, and with what's been happening with uh, the pandemic for one and then the election for two, <clears throat> there hasn't been a lot of uh, sleeping going on in the Shelley household as of late. So, uh, And it's been uh, one, one heck of a crazy time. And I think that, you know, for investors and traders alike, um, and even consumers for that sake, you know, this, uh, these types of times, you should embrace and you should be, I know that they may feel a tad unsettling for some and maybe even more for others, but these times are when the pond water is muddied up and you get an opportunity, uh, right? When, when, when things are, are status quo and locked in place, it's harder to break in whatever you're thinking of doing, whether you're a youngster trying to get in the business or you're a little older looking for some new strategies. I, I would really say that you need to embrace these times because when that muddy pond water uh, gets that way, it gives you an opportunity to maybe do something that you wouldn't have had the opportunity to before. So I love it when I love chaos because it, it opens the door up for things. And, you know, my phone rings a lot more during chaos too. So it's, it's a, a, a good thing uh, as long as it's uh, not bad chaos. And I know that we've had the pandemic and unfortunately there've been some lives lost there. Uh, but um Again, there's things that are going on. We talk about pandemic winners and losers, um, however insensitive that may or may not be, but it's the truth. Uh, there are strategies out there for everybody to kind of keep in mind as we navigate the next two to three years. So I'll kick off and say, yeah, you, you, you said um, what you said with my, uh, my slide. I've got the, uh, the, the disclaimer that they were very, very, very worried that I wouldn't put in there so everybody can now relax. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I come from a different time where that was, you know, I used to write in pencil on a card that didn't have a dupe on it. So now I'm in a place where I've got basically handcuffs and a ball and chain before I can do anything uh, or say anything online. But anyway, and I'll, I'll start off with the four things. Uh, you know, I'm old, right? I'm 32 years in the business, 16 of them in Europe. I'm, I was the, the managing director of the largest Japanese bank in London for four years. And I'll tell you, <clears throat> These, uh, these things that these kids or younger people are writing out of Wall Street, I see all of the research that a lot of you guys read too, um, uh, not to be too informal, but I, I disagree with a lot of it, but at least it, it spurs on conversation. Let's start with this came across my desk um, probably about eight weeks ago or maybe even 12 weeks ago when we were kind of running up to the election. And this is in order. This is actually in order of what the talking heads on Wall Street believed were the most important things for the second half of 2020 and then moving into 2021. The most important things in order. All right, so I'm gonna address them in order, but I would say I would reverse this for sure. 
and say the president would be number one, but that's just me because I'm old. All right, so talk about a vaccine. You know, uh, since I've written this, we've had some shocking, well, not shocking news, but good news about the efficacy of a new vaccine and, and uh, with a 90% um, success rate. Now, I'm not going to be too political on, on the, during this, this presentation, but you'll definitely know where I lean by what I have to say. And I, I'm just a little bit confused as to the euphoria that the market enjoyed on the back of the fact that we got a, a vaccine that's 90% effective on a virus that's got a 99% survival rate, okay? I didn't understand that. Um, I know that vaccines are going to make everybody feel better. And, and to that matter, I would say this. We've got a, a Fed, which I will get to later, but I'll jump ahead for a second, that's trying to take care of this virus like it's a monetary issue. And it's not. Um, in, in February, March for sure, and definitely April, the, the nation's media, the national media, scared Americans so much that the, the, the American investor, trader, consumer, their psyche is so bruised. It's changed the way we trade. It's changed the way we buy. It's changed the way we live. And it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with facts because we've we've gone down, and, and this, is a, this is a psychological issue, right? And I've talked about this ad nauseum for the last 18 years on television because the two things that the Fed worries about are inflation and deflation. And we never talk about deflation because no one wants to talk about a psychological issue, right? Inflation's easy, right? We raise interest rates. We slow the flow of money down. We try to get a handle on things like that. But when it comes to deflation, where we've got people not spending money, prices keep going down. And because they go down, people stop spending more money because it's going to be cheaper somewhere down the road. That's a psychological issue. And the Fed's got no tools for that. And that's why they're so afraid to talk about it. And that's why this is even much more difficult. It highlights the fact that this virus is a psychological issue. Yes, you can fight it with money, and we're going in debt incredibly so because of that. But it, it doesn't matter if I'm too afraid to come out of my house as a trader. I'm not going to go get the million dollars in gold bars at the end of my drive because I don't want to die. There's such a psychological issue that's enmeshed and intertwined in this that in order for you to be successful next year, you're going to have to navigate that. Because back to going back to a vaccine, a vaccine is not the panacea that everybody thinks it's going to be. It's not the panacea that the markets thought it was going to be uh, when we had the news on Monday. It's going to be part of the solution, right? But it's not the solution. Because just because you have a vaccine out there, and I've got this on my slide, there, there's 62% of people 17 and under for the flu took the, the flu shot, right? And then 45% of the people older, they took it. So roughly 50% of the people out there take the flu shot. Are we going to have that kind, kind of take up with, with the with COVID vaccine? Is it going to be mandated? Are you going to have to have it now? They're, they're, they're just announced that maybe uh, theaters are going to have to have you show proof of a vaccine or a negative test to get in. And, and I want everybody to remember I'm saying this because the survival rate is around 99%. Now, if you're over 70, it's 94.7%. 94.7%. I'll take those odds. But we have beaten everybody up so much so that they think that if you get it, you're going to die. And that's affected the economy adversely like you will never believe. And to that point, if these, if our electors, our, our legislatures, legislators, who we've now been listening to, uh, maybe even the new, uh, if it's Biden's administration, love him or hate him or love Trump or hate Trump, it doesn't matter. If we go down for another four to six weeks in another national lockdown, mark my words, it will put this economy back three to five years. It's might be, I think it's might be, you know, and we're already back two to three years. For every month we were down, I think it's going to take us four months to recover because of the psychological problem. People smarter than I, even though there's a vaccine out there, are still scared. People smarter than I still haven't gone to restaurants or left their houses yet. I know people have a much higher education than I do, and maybe I'm just dumb enough to not notice the danger, but that's what you're dealing with when it comes to investing. Now, I don't want to get too far off track, but it absolutely comes down on the side of a vaccine and what that's going to do for the markets. Now, we saw the knee-jerk reaction on Monday. So let's keep that in mind as we work through this because it's part of the solution, but it's not the solution. Now, these are just all 
it's, it's information and statistics uh, for the flu shot because that's the next best thing we have to, uh, to, to go against. But I, I have to say that um, when you saw the, the, the floods in, in New Orleans and they had to shut down schools there for a year, uh, the, 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 the guy that was in charge of uh, schools here in Chicago at the time was very uh, a key part of what was happening down in New Orleans when we had the, the hurricane that did what it did to New Orleans. I can't remember how long ago that was, but I do know that their schools were shut down. And he said the damage was the kids weren't a year behind. They were two to three years behind. And by doing that to our students here, that's going to be another thing that you're going to have to. So and the reason I bring that up is there's opportunity in some of those online learning things, right? There's opportunity and other uh, tools and technologies that are going to give you as an investor um, some good returns. And I have to say again, before we went into this lockdown, e-commerce as a total of retail sales, right, was still only running at about, depending on which numbers you looked at, 12 to 15% of retail sales or uh, online, okay? And we, we now know, we all know how big Amazon is. We, know, we all know how much Walmart's doing online. And to think that that's still only added up before the pandemic to 12 to 15% of total retail sales, that means that you still have an opportunity. Now, yes, it's gone up dramatically, I'm sure, but dramatically means maybe to 20%. What is that world going to look like when you're investing and trading when your retail sales are 50% e-commerce versus bricks and mortar? What's that going to look like? Because... You may think that that horse has left the barn on some of those, as they say, I hate using the word pandemic winners because nobody really wins in a pandemic, but the, the, the media uses the term pandemic winners, those, those online things. Um, it's almost like we hit hyperspace. If you remember playing asteroids, you're probably all a bit too young for that. But um, we got to where we're going faster because of COVID. We got to go, you know, we're going faster because of it's hyperspace. It's been uh, moving the e-commerce on steroids. And that means that don't think that that space is dead yet. Now, Yes, when we see the vaccine come out and you saw what happened to Peloton and all those uh, pandemic winners, they automatically became pandemic losers because people might start going back to gyms. People might start going back to shops. People might start going back to restaurants. But I think that, that, I think that those behaviors, and this is where I like to come in because I'm not a normal finance person, I, as you can see by me wearing my pajamas, right? Um, I, I think it's important to realize that uh, – we, we have fundamentally changed the way we live and it's not going back to the way it was. It will go back to maybe some semblance of that, but that's another opportunity for you as an investor. How is that going to change? I, I still say, even though Peloton and, and all those indoor places, I, I mean, I know people are social and like to work out, but boy, it's going to be difficult to kind of get people back to the gym for the next three years once they've bought these bikes, right? So there's a long-term trade there, right? You can see that trend. I think that we've got an absolute disaster with our, res our restaurants. I, I just, I, I, the way that things have been going as far as shutdowns and governors and our legislators, we're slowly but surely moving our main streets. I call it, you know, I, I write for the Northwest Indiana Times here in the editorial section on, on, on Sundays. One of my last articles was, was named, you know, we're, we're turning Main Street into a bed, bath, and a burger. What, what business plan, what business owner can suffer being shut down for four, five, six, maybe even eight months? Well, it's only the big box retail stores and chain restaurants. So you're going to wipe out all the mom and pop shops on everybody's small main street in their hometown. And it's just going to be Bed Bath & Beyond and Burger King, right? Because those are the only businesses that can handle that. And that's not a good thing. But that's something you have to keep in mind when you're investing in trading, right? Because they're going to be the winners, because they're going to be only things that can stay alive. So not to get beat up too much on that, but I, I thought it was interesting to see what those guys on Wall Street uh, really believe that the efficacy of a vaccine was going to be the most important thing. And I don't think that's, that's the case. That's why I like to bring it up. I think it's, again, it's part of the solution, but it's not the panacea that they think it's going to be. It's just going to be, um, uh, it's not the solution. All right. Now you can't see these because I think they're a little bit too small. I've, but this is going to be... Um, Doses of flu vaccine distributed per 1,000 people. And the number one is Canada, but it's 350 people per 1,000. That's 35%. So look at these numbers. 35% of Canadians got the flu vaccine. 25% of Americans. And look how bad it, you know. So that, that's going to be a good example of the take-up of, of, of COVID, unless it's mandated. Now, 
if you're like me and this whole contact tracing kind of makes me sick to my stomach a little bit more big brother ish, you know, they downloaded that COVID-19 thing onto everybody's phones this summer without you knowing about it. And if you have a phone and you're on Facebook, you're probably already being contact traced anyway. I mean, if that's, if you really want to look at things and before I get too upset, I have to remember that uh, in order to go to school as a little kid, we had to have our vaccines back then. Remember? So Having a vaccine to go to a movie might seem like a stretch, but, you know, we've had to have vaccines to play sports and go to school. So it's just moving down that line. So in order, instead of being upset about it, I try to remind myself that it's been happening before, how we handled it before. That's how we're going to handle it again. And away we go and take advantage of what the opportunity may be. You might be mad at uh, Aramark or some of these uh, cinema places because they may be doing that. But at the same time, it might give you an opportunity. You know, a lot of folks and traders will put their head in the sand uh, and if you keep your head up and keep an eye about what's happening around you, it's going to give you a place to go instead of a place to hide. Right. Then I thought to myself, I said self, um, what did the market look like during the last big pandemic, right? And I thought this was an interesting, uh, an interesting chart. This shows you what happened to the Dow Jones during the Spanish flu. Um, we didn't see that sell-off for, for uh, the, the COVID-19. Um, it wasn't 33% for sure. But you can see by this, the reason why I put it up there is it, it gives you a good idea about what happened afterwards. And remember, uh, this was like uh, the 1920s, and ultimately, finally, uh, we, we topped out. But I, I think it's nice to see that there is a history here, and the history says is that you can't close your eyes and buy anything but the market's not dead. Even if we have another sell-off, you know, do this quote unquote uh, second wave, which is irritating me. So um, second wave or no second wave, that's probably not going to be the case in the stock market. And that's why uh, I brought this up and put this chart up there. Now, again, it's a psychological problem. The government thinks you can secure a psychological problem with, uh, with bailouts. That ain't happening. It just delays the problem, right? It's like giving an alcoholic beer, he'll suddenly sober up and still the world still stinks, okay? That's not going to solve the issue. Um, and, I, and it's been highly politicized as well. That's why I put this. And then ultimately, you know, asking myself, does it really matter? Well, yeah, it does matter because as an investor, I have to have some sort of gauge as to where we are in this uh, economic revival, right? Now, whether you are on the left or you're on the right, I can, it's safe to say before the election, the economy was getting better, but at a slower rate. We were getting healthier at a slower rate. And now we're going to hand over that economy, maybe depending on what happens here, but let's assume it's Biden. We're going to hand over an economy that's been getting better at a slower rate to uh, an administration that has been talking about a $4.4 trillion tax hike. Well, how is that going to affect my my investing, right? How, how are uh, uh, profits, my, my uh, short-term capital gains from 20, 20% tax to 40% tax, how is that going to affect the market? How is that going to affect my strategy? Uh, how, how are, um, you know, the, the, the all these taxes on uh, inheritance tax or corporate profits going up by 33% from 21% to 28%, right? That's That's big. And so that could also be retarding growth, and I have to keep that in mind before I get too out over my skis and get really excited about a vaccine that a lot of people aren't going to take anyway. Might be mandated. We might see, you know, uh, riding in the streets because of this uh, contract tracing, but just be careful about getting too far out over your skis. That's really what the whole thing about this is. So growing at a slower uh, rate. Yeah, you know, I say aircraft carrier bad news, and I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer. I'm just trying to be realistic. We haven't taken into consideration all the businesses that have gone out of business in these big cities, especially the ones that are run uh, by the Democrats that have seen a lot of the damage. For instance, New York, New Jersey, Chicago, L.A., San Francisco. If I've been in the city of Chicago, I go in two to three times a week to do television there. The canyons are empty. Now, you know these big, tall skyscrapers that have a ton of shops on that mezzanine level, right, or the... Uh, on, the, on the main level, and it's, it'll be the key cutter guy, the laundry guy, the pizza guy, the tavern, the burger guy. They're all gone. I mean, they're gone, and, and they're not coming back because of our own willingness to cut ourselves. Because 
think about these policies that we put in place, and this isn't a political speech, this is the way it is, because it's going to have to be something, as a trader, you need to think about where's the growth going to come from. But when you have these big CEOs, not just in Chicago, New York, and LA, they're all over the country saying, you don't have to come back to the office until next summer. Well, that means all those businesses that are on the concierge level of these big, big sky rises, they need those buildings to be 80%, 90% occupied to make any money. They're gone, right? That's an unintended consequence of these CEOs telling their folks they don't have to come back. They're all shuttered in all the buildings I go to. Some of the very longstanding, um, very famous places that have just had to throw the towel in. And we're not taking that into consideration yet. So what I mean by this aircraft carrier of bad news still coming is that I think it's going to get worse before it gets better, regardless of this news we had on Monday about a vaccine hitting the market. I want it to get as I want it to get over with as soon as possible too. And I'm not being like again, I'm not being Debbie Downer, but I do definitely think that if you get too excited here and don't have your head above you and not in the sand, uh, if you're going to take into consideration governors not letting these build, not mandating that the buildings need to be full and the CEOs telling their people to stay home, number one. Number two, you fly into Chicago. I think 44 states are on the Chicago quarantine list. Same with New York. You have to give a DNA sample when you get off a plane in New York now, I believe. So are you going to be going to New York and Chicago anytime soon to do business, or are you going to have to do it over Zoom like this? Again, Zoom, great pandemic winner. But when we are finally fully open, I think you're going to find that there'll be a big sell-off in some of these things because people think, okay, it's all over, here we go, but that's not going to be the case because we're starting to change behaviors. And CEOs are also realizing, hey, maybe I don't have to be in the building. I know some very, very senior CEOs, very wealthy, that are starting to think, you know what, they've had great, they've had great production when their people are at home. Uh, they don't have to you know, rent the space anymore in the Sears Tower. Um, and and that, it can actually, actually affect their bottom line uh, in a much better way than it would be if he mandated everybody coming back. Now, to date, I've only heard of one, maybe two large investment banks, J.P. Morgan being one, that have said that they'd like to see their people start to come back. But think about all the other buildings in New York and Chicago and London for, you know, London for that matter. I mean, London's gone back on a full lockdown now. And I can't imagine what that's going to do to their economy long term. And, you know, and I will put this in there as a side note, a, a small PSA. Um, I said this in March of this year. And if you want to go read anything about what lockdowns do to the economy and how to invest, there's a lot of things out there. I actually Googled it and found some things. But I'll also say, generally speaking, when you look at these white papers about what to do during a pandemic, the first thing they all say are lockdowns don't work. And on most of these papers were written not during a pandemic. So there wasn't this overreaction or uh, you know, a scaredness in how these people were acting. And a lot of the things they say uh, make a lot of sense. So I do believe, again, it's a psychological issue. That's why the Fed struggles with that. That's why the government struggles with that. We're going to throw a lot of money at it from the government's point of view, and the Fed's going to try to do what they can do um, monetarily to see what we can do to, to prop up the markets, and they will. Okay, um, But just have that in mind when you're investing because there's going to be this psychological uh, issue with monetary and fiscal policy and how that shapes everything going forward. I'm talking too much now. So are we going to get a stimulus? Uh, fine. That's great. It doesn't, it's not going to matter. I mean, it's just going to extend the already uh, what's going to happen anyway. It's just going to delay what's going to happen anyway. Sorry. So uh, if we do do a stimulus, I think we'll get one by the end of the year, maybe ish. I, eh, I but that's just going to put us further in debt, and it's just going to stave off all the bad news that I've been talking about with these restaurants, uh, these buildings not being full, um, and then nobody can travel business-wise. That's going to kill air air travel. And look, you, you, you've already seen what's been happening there. Now, yeah, we hear these reports of the planes being full, and that can kind of cloud your image. But just go back and look. You know, if they used to have 20 flights between Scottsdale and or Scottsdale and uh, Chicago, now they only have five. So of course they're going to be full. So, but given the, you know, but on the plus side of that, they're given the chance to fly and people want to, they do, because they're all full. Believe me, I've been on. So uh, there is that democratic thought process of if I know the risks, let me take it myself. But that's a whole other hour sometime else. So are, are we going to have to suffer through these tax hikes? The market believes that the Senate will be held 
by the Republicans. And that's why it's comfortable. And you saw it rally as much as it did after Election Day and, and, the, and the next few days after that. You know, the week before the election, the market was off five and a half percent. The week after the election was up seven and a half percent. So we net net gained two two percent on the election. And it was once we had the surety, uh, we knew what was going to be happening. Markets don't like to be surprised. Um, the, the market was, uh, they say, gridlocked because the Republicans look to continue to hold the Senate. That's still not over. I think it will happen. But, boy, that would be the one uh, black swan that people have been not looking for that could really throw a wrench in the works here. But I, I agree with most out there that um, the Republicans will still keep that Senate. And that gives you that gridlock. And gridlock was on the menu of things that might happen out of this election. And the market saw that on the menu, so it wasn't surprised with grilled cheese when it thought it was going to be getting peanut butter and jelly. It's something that had been seen. It's something that had been expected. And that's why you saw the market do what it was going to do. So that means, in a long-winded answer, do I think we're going to get those tax sites? I think it's going to be very muted and much more difficult for those things to get through if that's going to be the case. And that's what the market was telling us last week. Uh, yeah, here's the truth. We don't, we're not allowed to talk about the truth, right? That doesn't get you on TV, that's for sure. But one in three households had trouble making ends meet before the pandemic, right? Now, uh, I, I'm, I was a fan of some of the things that were done with the economy as far as uh, lowering taxes and having less regulation. I understand the headline numbers far, as far as employment for um, uh, those uh, of, uh, you know, Black unemployment was low, women was low at all-time record lows, and as well as Hispanics. Um, that's really great news, and those are good headlines, but we still had some things that were struggling behind that. So going into the pandemic, one in three households uh, were having a difficult time making ends meet. Now, since then, I will say that it's been a disaster, uh, and that's to use that word uh, lightly. Um, I think at the end of August, uh, we had something like 60% of people uh, across the country missed their mortgage payments or only could pay a part of it. I mean, we had some really bad numbers as far as how these people are going to be living month to month. And that's why these stimulus things keep coming around, but it's only delaying the inevitable unless those restaurants are back to hundred percent capacity. And now while I'm on that, and this is a thing that I keep in mind when I invest, you have to use the left side of your brain sometimes, um, and that's what I do all the time. I was an art major, right? I wasn't a finance major until I broke my hands playing football, and then I became a finance major. So I look at things a little bit differently. And now we've got, you know, have you ever heard of Stockholm Syndrome? Well, you probably have. And that's just when you fall in love with your captors, right? If you can Google it. But you basically fall in love with those people that are keeping you oppressed. Patty Hearst is, is, is a good example if you're old enough to remember that story. So we've got our governors, and not, you know, governors across the country, they, they, you know, Democrat and, and Republican, have, have locked us down, and that's basically putting us in the trunk of their car and locking the trunk of the car, right? And so when they finally open up the trunk, um, we've jumped on them like a dog, excited to see them lick their faces and said, thank you, thank you for letting me out, and oh my gosh, I'm so lucky that you're allowing my business to be opened up 25% of its, of its customer base, which means 25% of its revenues, right? Or in essence, we should be acting like you just let your wife out of the back of the trunk and she punches you in the face, right? Because that's what should be happening across the country. But it's not. We've got our business leaders have fallen for this Stockholm syndrome, and we can't uh, uh, we can't get through our, our heads that this is retarding growth. It's hurting the economy immensely. And again, it's going to slow down our economic engine. I think for three years, we're not going to get back to normal. And if we lock down again, that's going to be extended. And so... We fall in love with our captors and we get angry. We're not angry. We get happy because we're allowed to be open to 25% of our revenues. So take this from the left side of the brain. You need, to, you need, your, you need your business to be 90% of the revenues to start making money. Ask anybody that runs a small restaurant. You don't, you don't have the option to, to give away 75% of your revenues and still stay afloat. It's just not, nobody's got that in their business plan, except for the governors think that that's an okay thing to do. And everybody's so happy to be opened up, they take it when it's absolutely impossible and there's no way that you can make money. So what that does, again, is that's my bad news, right? That aircraft carrier of bad news is when you only allow your, these, these restaurants, gyms, uh, whatever it is, uh, open up to 25% of the revenues, that means they're just going to sink slower. They're going to go out of business slower. There's no way you can stay afloat. So for anybody to think that's a good thing, you're, you're killing yourselves, kidding yourselves, 
and that's killing the economy. So I don't want to be, again, I'm just telling up the truth. This is the way it is. Um, that's not a good thing. And invest like that's a bad thing because you'll come out ahead because of it. There's no way anybody can live on just 25% of the, rev the revenues. So um, when we initially thought that was happiness, I still say that's not something to celebrate. Okay. That was too, that was a little bit Debbie Downer stuff. Again, this is a great example. I love charts because I can go off topic easier. <laughs> um, but this will show you we're, we're getting better, but at a slowing rate, right? Let's show you the job losses in the beginning. Uh, but look at these numbers slowly but surely ticking lower. And that's where you have to say we better have the Senate because we can't afford to have these jobs numbers ticking lower and have taxes do what they might do under this new administration. Now, like, again, whether you're from the left or from the right, it doesn't matter. It's just a numbers issue. And if you want to put $4.4 trillion tax hike plan in, 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 in motion, when you're looking at something like this, it doesn't bode very well. And that's why I put it up there. It's an easy, easy chart to look at and go, huh, where is that line trending? Uh, and what do we want to do? We don't want to be putting anything in its way. We want to be, you know, we want to be wind beneath its wings. Uh, wage replacement and stimulus. This is a pretty good one too. Unemployment benefits replace about half of the lost wages for the typical worker. Uh, the wage replacement rate, which is this, or share of earnings replaced by unemployment benefits ranges as low as 34% in Arizona, which means it's only replacing 34% of your lost earnings to 65%, which is a high in Oregon. But there's no 100% on there, is there? I put that up there because if you go on to these unemployment benefits, you're getting between 35 and 65% of what you're used to. And if that's the type of money you have in your pocket, you know, where are you going to spend it? Well, even if they open up the restaurants or, 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 or what have you to 25%, you don't have the power. Now, the consumer confidence levels have been okay. Um, and we do have a lot of money on the sidelines when it comes to investable cash. Depending on who you listen to, we have two and a half to four and a half trillion dollars waiting to come into the market. And if we go back to that chart, I showed you about how the market reacted over the Spanish flu. That's probably the best example of why there's money out there waiting to get on board and and maybe they've missed, missed the boat already. Who knows? I don't think so. Uh, but um, this is also a great visual example about there's a lot of people out there that don't own stocks. A lot of people down there haven't benefited from their 401ks going up. And their, their unemployment benefits are only replacing 35 to 65% of what their uh, regular earnings were. Um, this is another good one. Wage, this wage study, the $600 uh, weekly unemployment boost. Uh, and how it hits the workforce. Um, and what that means is basically workers are much more fragile nowadays than they were before. Now we're talking about in the next stimulus what this number may be, uh, 600, 450, 300. Um, I, nobody knows about what the – I think we're going to get a stimulus plan, which would be good for the markets, right? That's going to be something that the markets would like to hear. But, again, the best – I said this I say this over and over and over again. Uh, the best stimulus package that we can roll out to the American people is to open up the economy 100%. But that falls on deaf ears because it makes too much sense. So we have to go back to these types of things where our legislatures may or may not be looking like they're going to be rescuing us. And once we get these uh, wage, uh, these stimulus packages through, which would be great, short-term sugar high, and they allow us to open up our businesses again to 25%, things people all think we're back uh, back in business and away we go. And that's why I want everybody watching. Remember, that's still only 25%. You're going to sink slower. Your unemployment benefits aren't replacing your earnings. We're going to have to open up at some point in time. Um, I, I just don't know um, how we're going to help uh, heal the psychological pain. And I was on Fox two days ago and I got really called out because I did say it was going to be a three-year ordeal. And they asked why. I said, because I think that's how long it's going to take people to get over the psychological issue of the lockdown and the, the pandemic, because they really, really were feeling like in, in March, April, and May, if you got the virus, you were going to die. And, and that's just patently not true. Uh, the CDC had numbers that came out last week or two weeks ago uh, between the ages of uh, 19 and under. Um, if you caught the virus, your, survivable, your survival rate was 99.998%. I mean, that's, narrow, that's basically 100%. If you were between the age of 20 and 49, 
it dropped down to 99.7%. And then 50 to 69, it was 99.7%. And then over that was 94.7%, like I said earlier. But that doesn't matter. That doesn't make people feel any better, right? We all have a story about somebody that may or may not have lost their lives, and it is a serious thing. But I just want um, everybody to know that that's the psychological issue that we're going to have to get over. How long is it going to take to heal those people mentally? Because that's just how long it's going to take for us to get back to, to where we were. Um, when, are, when is somebody going to go sit in uh, Ann Arbor's football stadium of 105,000 people, shoulder to, sh shoulder to shoulder for four hours? When's that going to happen next? Um, it might if it's kids, and that's fine. I, I would say that's great because they're not the ones that are going to be really um, uh, get sick from this. But that's that's your investable questions. That's what I tell people all day, every day. That's how you have to make your decisions going forward. Uh, yeah, this uh, the pandemic has got is also widened the wealth gap, right? And the simplest way, forget about this chart. The simplest way that I can say that is this. Uh, mom and pop pizza joint on the on, on the corner of Fifth and Main, whatever you live in downtown hometown. Um, they're out of business because th that's their only thing they've got. They weren't making a ton of money beforehand, uh, but they had to be shut down for six months. They're gone. Uh, but if you were wealthier and in the upper echelon and you were deemed an essential business, Amazon, Walmart, Home Depot, or or the likes. Um, and you, you, you have money, you are the beneficiary, the pandemic winner of all that money that couldn't go to mom and pop, you know, Luigi's pizza, uh, because they were, they, they just didn't have the capital to even withstand four weeks out of business. It's, they ran things so hand to mouth that, uh, that's going to be the best example of that, uh, wage gap. And, 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 and just, to, I don't know how much time I have, but just as an aside, um, the, the, a big part of why we have that wage gap problem is it wasn't as bad and it's gotten increasingly bad. And I, and I, I think it's bad too. I, I, but in the seventies, before I went to school and college, um, a lot of big businesses had a representation of labor on their boards and it didn't have to be a union member either. It just, there was somebody on the board that represented labor. And in the eighties, when Jack Welsh came along uh, and, and, and the likes of, of folks like him, where they began to think that they had a fiduciary responsibility to the owners of the business, which meant shareholders, um, that, that, that laborer wasn't an owner in the business, it was a worker in the business, and that's when things started to go a little haywire. So we took those labor represent, representatives off the boards, um, and we sold our souls to the shareholders, and this is the problem that you get. That has exasperated, I think, the single biggest reason why you've seen that gap rise between uh, th those that are running the business and those that are working at the business because they're just no longer represented like they used to be. Uh, and I think that's coming back a little bit. That's, that needs to be fixed. But this type of thing with a pandemic only exasperates and exaggerates those problems. Well, uh, this is uh, we all see the numbers. Jobless numbers came out today. Uh, I mean, they're, they're getting better. But again, like I kicked off this, this talk, uh, uh, I think that for every one month we were hurt, we're going to take three to four months to heal. And I think that we solidly had a three to four, maybe five month hurt. Um, that could be as many as 15 months to heal, right? So that's a year and a half. Uh, that puts us out a couple years after the pandemic, maybe three, and that goes right in line with what I'm thinking about what's going to take for this market to get back to normal. Now, what's that mean to say equities? I think that you could see equities run, right? Because we've got all that investable cash on the sidelines. And it's got to go someplace. Um, another little cheat sheet number for you. But in the last 35 years, we've, I don't know how many more billions of dollars that have come into our business for, um, for the purposes of investing. But I can tell you this, we've lost half of the investable products. What I mean by that is this, the amount of stocks you can invest in today is 50% of the amount it was in the 1970s. So if you have half as many things that that money can go to and five to 10 times as much money, doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what might happen to those stock prices. Okay. So keep that in mind too. As long as our, the, the little dirty little secret is as long as we've got that issue combined with the fact that we still have a growing population and we're giving birth to more customers, it bodes well for the short-term future of those markets. Look at other countries where they've had a steady birth rate or a declining population and see what it's done to their stock markets. It's a much different and more difficult problem to kind of get over. 
Okay, um, this is really just going to highlight how much money we're spending. Um, uh, where do I begin? Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit bearish on the whole thing because I just don't think money is going to solve the problem. It helps or pushes off the ultimate day that we have to come to a reckoning, but it's going to be something that we have to worry about in our investment lives because it's going to happen on a day-to-day -day basis. So depending on the next package that they pass, it can be as much as in total, right? Not just this next package. Next package could be one and a half to two trillion, whatever, two and a half trillion. And I can't believe I'm saying trillion. I mean, if you really knew what trillion was, um, it's it's a phenomenally large number. But that will have meant, say, if we were shut down March, April, May, June, July, August, SEP, ah, that's eight months. We will have invest, we will invested five and a half trillion dollars into the economy, 5.5, I mean, our economy, our economic engine, our, our, our total, our economy is only about $23 trillion a year anyway, is what our GDP is. I mean, that's 25% of it, 30% of it, we've, we've spent in, in eight months to try to get ourselves out of this problem. That's a phenomenally large number. And again, that's gonna be, uh, that'll be retarding our growth going forward because we're gonna have to find that money somehow. And uh, it's just not gonna be growing on trees and they're talking about even more now, um, which you have to keep in mind is going to, that's why, oh, this really needs to be said, that's why you've got those inflation hawks out there that are always still so worried about inflation. And I understand that. Um, and because of the amount of money that's been hitting our, our, our streets, and when, when I say that, I don't mean actually literally, literally hitting the streets, but when we have stimulus packages go out there, that money does somehow wind its way back to Wall Street. And a lot of times it's uh, an investable cash, right? And so we always worry about inflation because it cheapens our dollars. It cheapens a lot of things around us. And if you've got an inflation rate of 3% and you're only getting a 2% rise at work, you're losing a percent of your income every year. Everybody can understand that. But also central banks like to see a little inflation because it makes us feel good, right? Your house goes up in value. Uh, everybody can see their house going up in value, even though they might not see that the house went up in value by 4%, but they lost 5% of wage growth on their pay packets, right? They don't care about that as much as, so inflation can be seen as a good thing. And because of that, since 2008, our government, whether it may be under Trump or, or Obama have been, they've been trying to stoke inflation. We've been trying to buy inflation. We've been trying to import inflation. Uh, and that's what you're doing with the interest rates, right? Uh, and look in Europe, they've got negative, year, negative rate 10 year yields. Right, so you borrow money from the bank and you have to pay back less. How would you like that deal? So, these this idea that uh, we're always worried about inflation, I understand. But for 12 years, we've been trying to buy it, steal it, borrow it, and we can't seem to get it. We can't. And so, what we've been putting into our economic engine, uh, if you measure about what we're putting in versus what's coming out the exhaust, it doesn't add up. There's a leak somewhere that Janet Yellen couldn't find, uh, and and hopefully the new guy can find is what Powell can find because um, that's going to be the big issue. So I, I, I have to pay respects to inflation, but up until now, it's just not there. So can I continue to invest on maybe it's going to be around the corner? Maybe it's going to be around the corner. Maybe it's going to be around the corner and still sell bonds because that's going to be the case. And bonds are going to tank because we're going to have to raise rates because we're going to have to really get out in front of this inflation. But that's when we've been trying to do that for 10 years, and all bonds have been doing is going up, 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 and up. Now, they've recently sold off as of late because they're getting excited and a little bit out over their skis because we've got a vaccine. Life's going to get back to normal, and we're all going to go back out to restaurants that are going to be 100% capacity. You can sense my skepticism there, but that's why you've seen the recent move in some of these uh, bonds. But I still see, I still think that you'll still slowly but surely as this aircraft carrier of negative news works our way bond yields will start to come in and bonds will start to rally in price. And then on top of it, you've got the Fed standing behind the market, basically going to do what it's going to do to make sure that we don't have any issues like we had in March or April. Um, it's going to be there and they've pledged they're going to be there. It's just one of those things that as I've gotten older, uh, if the Fed says it, that means they mean it. It's not worth fading. Uh, so you have to keep in mind the fact that uh, they're they're going to be there for the market and you know that interest rates. If we get something that gets a little bit nervy out there, um, they're going to stand behind. They'll, they'll do what they got to do, whether it may be um, 
quantitative easing where they're buying a ton of bonds. Again, here we go with these bonds. We need the round because we're going to keep interest rates low to try to keep business going. That's something that you're going to have to keep in mind. And that's something why I have in my brain about, you know, we've got the Fed standing there saying that they're going to do what they're going to do. That It should be inflationary, but it's not because they're saying what they're going to do because things aren't good out there, right? A great example is every Thursday or every Wednesday, I can't remember when it comes out now. I should. We get a read on what the 30-year mortgage rate is, right? And it's just been marching down on lockstep from three and a quarter to now I think it's 280 or just under. I think it just dipped below 280. Well, everybody celebrates that and thinks that's good for housing. Well, it could be, yeah. I, can, I can't argue that's it's bad for housing. But why is it coming down? It's coming down because things aren't that great out there, right? So you can't have your cake and eat it too. That rate's coming in is because the U.S. economy is still struggling. And it's not coming in because things are going well. As soon as things go well, you're going to see that, that, you know, that rate balloon out to three, three and a half. And then that will help put a little bit of a cap on, on the housing prices and the housing market. But it's not, it, it's not a reflection of how well the economies are doing. It's actually a reflection of how poorly the economy is doing and how, might, how much it might be short-term sugar water to a housing market that's been more bound for, for you know, 18 months. Um, here's some of the bullets um, that you can use. I'm getting close to my time, I guess. But some of the bullets the Fed can use. Fed funds rate, forward guidance, they talk their, you know, their mouths off. Um, security purchases, which is quantitative easing, I mentioned that. Uh, lending to securities firms. Um, there's all types of things, I won't bore you with this, but there's all types of things that they will march out to make sure that they've got steady equity prices and um, the, 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 the money continues to flow downhill and get in all the pockets of Americans so that we can try to get back to where we were uh, before this happened at the end of 2019. Um, these are more of those ideas. Uh, going back to this psychological stimulus, again, you can't cure a cold with cash. Remember that, okay? Not to say that this is a cold, but it's a virus, and cash doesn't cure it. And It's going to be getting the economy back to where it was. And, and, and getting the economy back to where it was, I hate to say it, but it's just going to take time. And so you've got an opportunity here to play the market like that because it's just going to take time. Now, again, uh, there's less than half of the stocks to invest in today that we did in the 1970s. Um, there's two and a half to four and a half trillion dollars sitting out there on the sidelines of investable cash. Um, and we have an, a, a, a population that's going to continue to rise. That's all good for stocks. And that probably will be the case for 2021. The only thing that would say slow that down would be some punitive tax hikes, which could happen. So yes, there will be a lot of eyes on, on uh, Georgia to see if the Republic Republicans can make sure that they hold the Senate. And then I think that you'll see the market take a big sigh of relief. Um, Biden's man, you know, plan, <laughs> national mass mandates, four to six weeks shutdown, um, pay, paid money for care, you know, caregivers, uh, CDC trackers, I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there we're going to have to come to grips with. I'm not going to make a judgment call on this on this uh, Zoom, but I, I think that uh, some of it can be pretty scary, scary if you ask me. But, again, um, we scared the American populace so bad in, in March of 2020 that it's going to take them a little, bit, a little while to come out of their holes. Uh, these are just a bunch of uh, graphs on um, – attitudes and behaviors regarding and the reason why I put it up there is I take all this into consideration for my investing attitudes and behaviors because that'll, that's really more truer than the month to month numbers that we get and how people are actually feeling um, it's it's hard to gauge but it's a better I think it's a better judgment than um, just a number in thin air when you don't have any reference point around it so um, these are two lines. One's Republican, one's Democrat. Republicans are the dash. Democrats are uh, the blue. You can see that the Democrats are much more worried about COVID. They wear the mask more often. They haven't gone into the workplace as much. Um, it's a, a, a total uh, a different attitude from one side of the aisle to the other, which, again, I think will make it much more difficult to get over. Um, that's my web, web address. It's uh, 52 minutes past the hour. I could go on for another hour. Um, you probably shuddered when I said that. I'm sorry, but uh, 
it's been a great, great opportunity to speak to you all. Um, and again, I try to stay out of too political, but you need to know everything in order to make those investing decisions going forward. It all bodes pretty well. It's just not as good in one style as it is in another. Sure. Well, Scott, once again, thank you so much for a terrific hour. And that's why we wanted you here, because we know that you speak your mind. And not only that, but you have a lot of substance behind what you have to say. And each one of the speakers that we've had yesterday, today, et cetera, also are bringing their thoughts about the markets because they're making investment and trading decisions, you know, for today and where they see things going forward. And I think what you did is you touched in a macro way on all those key pillars of, 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 of our economy that basically will drive this economy one way or the other or keep it stabilized. I just wrote down so many questions that I would love to be able to chat with you about because I think some of the things that you said were fairly provocative as well. Yes. But they represent a point of view. And at this point in time, there are no certainties. So it just depends on your perspective. I think, you know, from my perspective, the biggest takeaway that I, that I have from this, and I think that you're spot on, is that given the nature and the size of the impact of COVID, that it would be a mistake to think that there's a silver bullet that's going to turn things around in a matter of months. It is a long-term process. And when I think about things, for example, when we talk about, let's say if we said tomorrow, let's open up all the businesses and open all the economies. Let's say that statement was made. It still gets down to the individual consumer as to how confident do they feel about taking advantage of the fact that things are open. You know, 60% 60, 60 of them have said they wouldn't go out. Right. So from that standpoint, it gets into what would it take to move them? And that's where I think, once again, a combination of things like testing, treatment, vaccine, time, things of that nature are going to slowly build that confidence. So even opening everything up tomorrow doesn't change anything. Wow. And I agree completely with you. I, you know, <clears throat> one of my side little businesses is I'm a drummer in a rock band in Austin, Texas, and have not played a gig since the 6th of March. Austin is the live music capital of the United States, so we claim 280 spots open every day for live music. All have been shuttered. So that one little perspective is what's happened to bars, bands, booking agencies, lighting people, sound technicians, across the board, that whole subset of business has been erased. Many of these people very, very poorly equipped to do anything else from a skill standpoint. And I, don't, and I don't think that we've digested all of those numbers yet. I really don't. No, I don't think so either. Because they're not top line numbers. You know, they don't really hit you. But we know that it exists. And in a town like Austin, where revenues come from that, you know, I was taking a look at the, 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 de the Democratic plan coming forward. And there's a big number there for local, state, et cetera. I just think that's a function of where the need has shifted over time. Because if the revenues locally aren't coming in, for example, to go ahead and local revenues are coming in for police, fire, you know, services, you know, trash pickup and things of that nature. Where is it going to come from? I don't want to pile on in this regard, but I just think I was, I guess, I'm not asking a question. I just think I'm agreeing with your assessment. Well, that there's an awful lot to take into consideration. Again, wherever you stand on the aisle, it doesn't matter. If, if you're for defunding the police or, or against defunding the police, coronavirus defunded the police because we shut down everything that gains tax revenues to pay for those municipalities. Right. And we don't have the money to pay for those people. You may you say you, you hold so clear and dear to your heart because um, look, we're, we're going to be trimming uh, the mayors around America are already, they're threatening their constituents with the fact that we're going to have to trim um, uh, plans and things that we, you know, these, these benefits because they just don't have the money because they've been shut down. And what really bothers me, Raleigh, is the fact that they didn't make that leap. When you shut everything down, you don't have any tax revenue. Right. And then I, I wrote a big article, and, and I'm getting a little off, but I, I have to get it out there or I'll explode. But, you know, the simplest example I can tell you is all those Austin bars, right? They're, they must have liquor licenses. And a lot of those local legislatures, legislators um, will threaten them with pulling their liquor license if they do anything wrong, right? Because Correct. they're hard to get. Right. Let's just say... That, that liquor license, and I don't know how much they are, but I do know they're expensive and hard to get, will cost 1200 bucks for the year, 100 bucks a month. Now, if, if you're shut down, government mandated shutdown for four months, I would be, the question I'm asking is, when am I going to get my 400 bucks back? Right. I mean, that to me makes, because anything short of that is stealing. 
But I'm just shocked at the American constituency that it's just so, in the name of safety, they roll over and take it. You know, I don't understand. They should be angry. Then when you have your restaurant open to or your bar or your live music venue to 25% of its revenues, oh. that means you're only using $25 worth of your $100 uh, liquor license. So you should only have to pay 25 bucks a month until they open you up to 50 and then it's 50 bucks. See, but nobody's saying this because they're just so shell-shocked and that's where I bring that psychology thing back in a little. Sure. I wanted to ask you another question because it's not something that came up specifically, but I'm sort of prolifically aware of it. And I thought I would pose it to you. And that is, do you have any concerns about the commercial real estate market? Big concerns. Yeah. Very big concerns. I mean, and it's been exacerbated by COVID as well. It's, yeah, it was bad going in. It was bad going. And you know what? I, yes, I've got big concerns about commercial, commercial real estate, but I also don't understand, or at least I do, but I think it's a short-term sugar high. Um, this housing market that we're in the middle of right now and lumber going through the roof uh, because people are, are fleeing these big cities because they want to get out into uh, more greener pastures. There's not enough there for them to buy. They build. That's been pushing up short-term prices there. We're not replacing them in the cities. For God, we all know that those numbers are horrific. And so we've got a short-term exodus, which is pushing housing through the roof. But I tell you what, after the spring of next year, you're going to see that come home to roost. And I think that it's going to be difficult. I really do, because commercial real estate will be hurting. You're not going to have any more of an exodus out of those cities because those that wanted to leave have already have left. And you're going to have an economy that's not doing very well. So what's that going to be? What's that going to do to the short term? You know, there's only two places I think that the housing market's going to stay hot. And I think that's going to be uh, Arizona because of the Californians fleeing and they continue to flee. And, I, and I'm here in Northwest Indiana, and for the last four years, it's been Illinoisans fleeing Illinois because of the high taxes, and they're going to continue to flee. Those are the only two places, I think, that will continue to go down those paths. Uh, but the rest of the country, you have to be very careful about getting too far ex out over your skis and excited about a short-term sugar high because of a, of a, of a short-term exodus out of the big cities to the greener pastures of the suburbs. Sure. Well, Scott, I tell you what, that hour flew by, my friend. <laughs> And well, it was, oh, you know, and we were really delighted to have you here. And I hope everybody here in the room really got a chance to to fully embrace what Scott had to say, because it's, it is very consistent and contemporary with everything that's being presented over the past couple of days, which are just the things that we need to be aware of when we decide to make decisions about how we want to trade and invest our dollars. And, and Scott, you're right. There could be a whole nother bolt on discussion to this. So that says, okay, let's go to work on some of these assumptions. So if you were at this point in time looking to build or manage or shuffle your portfolio, what are the things that you would look at? But those are some of the things that our other speakers are going to cover, but right. thank you. Thank you so very, very much for coming today it was delightful getting to meet you right. and we hope to have you back <laughs> okay i love it thanks to pat you Mickey. Person next time right yeah maybe in person thank you pat and again i enjoyed every minute of it hopefully everybody else did too thank you scott thank all you right scott. all right so let me go ahead and uh, grab my screen here do, 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 do. here we go Boom. So, folks, that was Scott Shelley with Optimus Futures, Opti uh, AG Optimus, and uh, the special, not really a special offer specifically associated, but he is associated with Optimus Futures, and he is an active trader and uh, just encourages people, if you want to check out the kind of services that are provided by Optimus, you can go to westmarktrading.com, M11-Optimus, and you can check out the Optimus Flow signature trading platform and some of the key features and benefits that are associated with that. Because essentially, as you saw him, he was dressed up in his cow outfit. That's what he wore on the floor when he was an active trader. He continues to trade actively, but he obviously also is an expert uh, and presenter across a multitude of mediums, including ours, Pat. <laughs> well, I know we had uh, the pleasure of meeting him for the first time in person when we uh, hosted an event at the CBOE, and we were just blown away mm -hmm. with. And it, and it's not that he, yes, he has a political uh, slant, but at the same time, he's very good about uh, sharing how that affects trading. And that's really what we felt was the most important to bring uh, to people during these past two days. 
Exactly. And I think that's something that is probably worth reinforcing is that you have to set the political issues aside because there's a set of realities that are there. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to trade and invest around those realities. And these folks are here to help us try to understand what those are. I think we all can agree that times are volatile and uncertain. Mm -hmm. And how do we plan around that? And, how, and, you know, we've got some awesome lineup this afternoon of speakers that are coming that are going to drill down on exactly that point. But before we get there, we have a quiz. We do. We, we love do. our quiz time. Yes, indeed. So as always, you can only win once a day. Um, this quiz is for a $100 Amazon gift card. And the quiz question is, who is the first president married in the White House? Got it. And the winner is Julius Cruz. Julius, our moderators will get with you to get your email address so we can send that out to you. That's the answer. Grover Cleveland married 21-year-old Francis Folsom on June 2nd, 1889. You know, I'm embarrassed that I don't know the answers to these. And Obviously, a lot of these people are not Googling it. They're putting it right yeah, in Yeah, we had there. a lot of people get this one right. So I know the moderators were having a hard time keeping up. <laughs> <laughs> but that's incredible. It's, it's I, you know, because I, I know when I was researching these things and selecting them, I was thinking the same thing, Pat. And I was going, then I had to say, why would I know this? <laughs> yeah. this one. Yeah. Where, where would I have known this?